and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, as always, is my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. Yo. We are, ba we are back once again. We are... Getting closer and closer to the home stretch when it comes to Veil of the Void. And our instance, uh, in this case, of calling an audible. Because I, th I thought we were I thought we were getting dangerously close to the end before we'd have to do the um, ra the wrap up bits, but nope, not quite. I convinced the monk that the vehicles page and the vehicles chapter is actually much. Uh, much necess much more necessary than previously understood because there are unique rules to vehicles and unique customization options yeah and vehicles is so vehicles is something that ev that everybody wa everybody wants in their games but nope but not enough people actually want to use it because it means dealing with a whole new set of mechanics sometimes and if I'm being honest, there's a lot of games that, even when they have vehicles, they are they are very underwhelming when it comes to the idea of vehicular combat. Yeah, but I think while vehicles do have a unique set of rules here, it looks like their underpinnings are still the same underpinnings as those of characters. Yeah. Which I'm perf I'm perfectly fine with, and I'm ma I'm mainly taking pot shots at um at at the most ubiquitous fa the most ubiquitous fantasy game having a having a character archetype that's all about mounted combat and yet and yet nobody act and yet nobody actually uses because um because of all the extra baggage that they try and put on mounted combat. Not only all the extra baggage, but the fact that um, vehicles in general. Are uh, whether they're a mount or whether they're a wagon or whatever are just kind of there. Mm -hmm. And this is where people would get, would use that line from Crawford about how, oh, we put we made that blank so that people could come up with it in their own ways. Mm. Also known as the Bethesda argument. Not just the Bethesda argument, also known as the um, the flex seal argument. Or if I want to be extra spicy, the um, the essence twenty argument. Oh, jeez! Stop! 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 We don't we don't need to bring that back up. No. I will eventually write essence trinity, but one project at a time. Indeed. And. Granted, granted, the Chocobo Knight in our project is is going in that is that bor is our is our take on the Born in the Saddle archetype, but mm -hmm. in that case we're just in that case we're just making it a another arm of the systems we've already developed. Yeah. And since and since we're not using a grid, we don't have to worry about some of the things that other people have to worry about. But... Remember, everybody, FF Legend takes a note out of old school Final Fantasy. We got front row and back row. That's all you need to know. Hmm. I want to dock points for rhyming, but I can't. It was deliberate anyway. Mm -hmm. Dock points all you want. I am shameless. Yeah. But <laughs> with something like Veil of the Void, the kind of the vehicles that we'd have to cover is is not as simple as it might be in other settings because not only would we have to cover terrestrial vehicles but also bigger stuff as well as interstellar travel because it isn't just a case of saying punch it or um or go or going with whatever war whatever warp factor star trek goes with this week what factor fuck you <laughs> um just don't bring just don't bring up going warp 10 I'd rather not think about that episode again. But can they go plaid? Voyager tried, and we saw how that turned out. 
Well, they're clearly they, they clearly don't have the Schwartz with them, but that's a different story. I see that your Schwartz is as big as mine. <laughs> uh, but for this set for this entry we are covering vehicles and we will we will start with the general vehicle stats. Oh, now, right. the, these affect all vehicle types. Starships, tanks, mechs, cars, etc. All vehicles upon construction or purchase gain an expertise. They have, this, they have the same three virtues, power, vitality, and finesse. They can carry as many weapons as half their vitality virtue. If a vehicle has three or less finesse, it takes a full round to turn around. If it has more than seven finesse, it gains an auto-hit die on dodge checks and uses no movement to turn around. Vehicle shields can reduce damage from several attacks equal to their vitality stat. Example, five vitality with ten shields can reduce ten damage from five attacks before expiring. After expiring, it takes one round to recharge. That's an interesting way to, to go about shield use. Um. Oh. If a vehicle takes more than 100 damage in one shot or is hit by a critical attack, the shield expires. If a shield expires this way, it takes a hard 4 mechanics check to reset. If it is not reset manually, shields will automatically reset after 3 rounds. Which is convenient, but 3 rounds is just enough time for the enemy to kill you. Yep, whole damage is bad, people. Remember that. All that's needed is just one hole, is just one hole in the ship. Yeah, if you don't have any bulwarks, that one hole kills you. Everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, see, then we have vehicle combat rules. Well, general, general ones. These combat rules are shared by all vehicles. When combat begins with a vehicle, the pilot, co-pilot, or captain rolls 1d6 and adds the vehicle's initiative bonus, finesse plus bonuses. That becomes the vehicle's initiative. When attacking, roll using the vehicle's power, and then add any bonuses from the PC's weapons mastery skill and expertise. When inflicting damage, add the vehicle's power to the damage instead of the user's. All ranged weapons have a twenty have a twenty-five clip and take an action to reload. And so, this is what I was talking about with the with the same underpinnings as characters. They have. Three of the six virtues that characters have, the three v virtues that you would expect a vehicle that doesn't actually have its own intelligence to have, power, vitality, and finesse. And then those are all used in the determining roles, just like they are in the determining roles for person-to-person -person combat. Mm -hmm. uh, then, but then we have starship combat rules. All starships have a basic attack not listed on their stats that inflicts 2d6 plus 10 piercing damage, fires in a 360 degree angle, and may be used only by the pilot or co-pilot. It's a phaser turret. Um, it, the the barrage maneuver or the or alpha strike. <laughs> the reason I say it's a phaser turret is because phaser turrets are the only phasers that can fire in a 360 degree circle. Mm -hmm. Phaser banks fire in arcs, people. Um, just don't put min don't put minions on your on your surface to air weapons. That, that's that that kills everybody before those weapons even reach them because they die of cringe. <laughs> in that case, put it on all of them. <laughs> uh, the pilot and co-pilot always have one action to perform attacks using the basic attack of the starship weapon masters always have two attack actions to use with any other available weapons that's okay <laughs> so you get a basic attack and special attacks wait a minute my MMO senses are tingling auto attack in your GCDs what could it be? Yeah, you just have the pilot and co-pilot arguing about what actions to actually use. <laughs> but this is also a good way to di to divest action economy. Indeed. Especially if one per if one has more has um has weapon master and the other doesn't. Oh. 
Let's see, then we have Starship Rolls. Starships are a big part of the universe. They become a roaming base for the PCs, even growing over time into its own character. Hi, Bebop. Hi, F hi Serenity. Hi, <laughs> uh, hi, Outlaw Star. Okay, okay. In that ca in that case, that might be a little bit too literal because uh, because of the AI, but you get the point. Yeah. Um. Oh yeah, and the and the Normandy. Can't forget about the Normandy. Specifically, the Normandy SR2, mm -hmm. which comes with your own Robo Waifu. Yep. Uh, you can't you can't steal her from Joker though. Sorry guys. But the but anyways, while in ship combat, including both space and the void, all players on the same ship share initiative. Smart. There are several roles that are defined here to give examples of actions that occur aboard a ship. Captain's chair may give player an additional action or auto hit die. Um, Make it so, number one. Mm -hmm. uh, communication officer performs speechcraft checks to give adversary ships one to two auto miss dice on checks. <laughs> Engineer, repair the ship's hull and direct shield power, adding plus two attack reductions. Now so you repair the ship, and you. This is this is legitimate. Did he play too much STO? I feel like he played too much STO. I'll have to ask him. <laughs> oh, <laughs> navigator. Yeah, na navigator performs checks to give the ship proper heading during jumps eh, ju during warps and jumps. May perform a hard four analysis check during combat to target a weak point on the ship, giving weapons plus one bonus die to attacks against it. Prepare a high yield torpedo, and on it, please write "Don't fuck with the Cisco." <laughs> Uh, Let's see. Pilot. Performs movements, dodge checks, etc. May also perform one attack during the starship's basic weapon once per round. Just don't actually become pilot. And there's my Farscape joke. Remember that pilot and Moya are the same thing, mm -hmm. sort of. Let's see. And then Weapon Masters. Performs attack using the ship's power and weapon stats. But you can have multiple weapon masters? Does that mean if you have a big enough party, they can fire off every goddamn weapon on the ship every fucking turn? As long as you've got enough, as long as you've got enough, I guess. But <laughs> imagine if you're piloting a fleet vessel, monk. Oh yeah, we've got a literal battleship crewed by thirty player characters. Most of them are weapon masters. Are you fucking kidding me? What? It says wep weapon masters always have two attack actions, as we mentioned before. Um, it doesn't say that that's all. All of the weapon masters have have that. I know. And remember, in order to have that, you just need to have one point in that skill. Yep. 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 Oh. <laughs> and we have non-space slash void combat. When you use a ship, when you use a starship in non-space combat, example, while on a standard PC map, a few rules change. Your ship can move three times base movement. It may hover if it is not gigantic plus, i.e., fleet size. If you move the ship, you must move up to its base movement. On the round after you move, you must move again up to the ship's base movement. That's what we call inertia. It takes one full round to turn the ship around unless the ship is a fighter size or has a finesse of seven plus. Imagine if someone get imagine if someone gave a fleet ship um seven plus finesse. <laughs> I almost that almost sounded accusatory, monk. Why would you ever accuse me of such a thing? I don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's not like I've designed a dreadnought ship in space engineers that could turn on a dime or anything. <laughs> uh, and when when you attack with the starship's weapons on non-vehicle or non-massive creatures, you inflict plus 2d6 additional damage and an automatic critical hit on successful attacks. <laughs> I'm a shoot that little guy right down there. Are, are you are you sure you want to Are you sure you want to waste a cannon shot for that, sir? Yes. Make sure that the other people get the message in the splash zone. This would also be yes, a good sir. way to integrate fire support into campaigns. <laughs> Okay. You know, because it's not like carpet bombing isn't a thing. Okay. Open the bomb bay doors. Do we have bomb bay doors? It's just it's just the fighter bay doors, but they're gonna put bombs on the on the hatches. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, at the at the very least it'll be a bomb it'll be a bomb run that actually makes sense. But har 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 <laughs> Uh, then we have disabling ships. When a ship reaches zero HP, it is considered disabled and running on half power, preventing shields and engines from operating. The only actions it may perform is a two-square movement action. If it is attacked by another ship in this state, it gains two negative HP per strike. After reaching ten negative HP, the ship will explode. It can be fully reactivated after 25 HP has been restored. Um, this is why having an engineer's report is important. Mm -hmm. Although, bit of a typo, it says has be restored. Has be. Mm -hmm. Like it has been. <laughs> interstellar, interstellar travel. Reactan is vast and filled with an infinite number of systems and planets waiting to be explored. To get to these places, a ship requires one of the two major travel drives, jump or warp. It's funny, some t those terms are used interchangeably, and here we have both of them. Probably different types of drives. Probably. Or, diff or different amounts of travel, maybe. So first we have jump drives. Jump drives are more common and safer than warp engines. They open a small portal within a set distance and send the starship through it. These systems are safe and reliable, but it does take time to charge up and cool down. Jumps can f consume fuel take time to charge, and have cooldowns for a set amount of time based on the distance to your destination. The charge on the table below is how many rounds it takes to jump instantly. So if it's a neighboring planet, takes two charge, twenty minute has a 20 minute cooldown, and takes 40 tons of fuel. If it's a neighboring system, um, four charge, eight hours of cooldown, and takes 350 tons of fuel. If you're going to Zion, Hi, Morpheus. Six, six charge, 12 hours of cooldown, and 350 tons of fuel. So, as a side note, Zion is essentially the central embassy of the Star Council itself, near the center of the Reactin galaxy. Mm -hmm. and this is according to the map of Reactin. Mm -hmm. Distances stack, and each increment of distance adds that much additional charge time and fuel costs for your travel. When attempting to jump, the following checks must be completed after the charge time is complete. If they fail, they can lead to difficult outcomes. Regardless of success or failure, the ship then jumps. So You have to have all three of these things? Wow. The pilot has to perform an average three piloting check. The navigator has to perform an average 3 analysis check, and the engineer has to perform an easy 2 mechanics check. This is considered safer. I can see why. We should have guessed from it being called a warp engine, Monk. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Warp travel conversely, is a rarer form of travel primarily because of the effect it has on ships, the higher cost, and the dangers of riding the veil. 
Warp engines allow for further travel than a jump drive and have no cooldowns. The warp engine is more dangerous than a jump drive. A small tear into the veil, the barrier between the realms and the void, allows the ship to ride through to its destination. This process is rough on a ship and requires precision piloting. It also consumes more fuel, as it is not one jump but sustained velocity. When a ship warps, choose the destination. Specific time and fuel amount will be consumed based on the distance traveled, shown in the chart below. Once again, neighboring planet takes 5 minutes, 50 tons of fuel. Neighboring system, 5 hours, 500 tons of fuel. And Zion, 12 hours and 500 tons of fuel. Distance is stacked, so for each increment of distance, add that much additional fuel. So it gives an example. If you warp from your current location to a planet that is two planets away, it would take you 20 minutes and consume 200 tons of fuel. When attempting to warp, the following checks must be performed after the charge time is complete. If any fail, they can lead to difficult outcomes. Pilot, average 3 piloting check. Navigator, easy 2 analysis check. Engineer, average 3 mechanics check. And then we have no. some... Go ahead. I was going to say that example when it says a planet two planets away... That that only seems like going through three neighboring planets, and so should be fifteen minutes and one hundred fifty tons of fuel. Because if I, I I would assume that your starting planet is not counted as planet one. Planet one would be the first planet in the chain, and then planet two would be the second planet in the chain, and then planet three is the planet that is two planets away. I think it would be a GM discretion thing, but yeah, a little clarification would certainly be helpful. Yes. Uh, but then we get to some of the fun stuff that can happen in the Void, like Void Sickness. Like I said, we should have known from the name Warp Engine, Monk. Terrible things begin to happen to a ship in the warp for more than ten hours. Void Sickness, a terrible infliction on the mind, is the most common effect of long-term warp travel. So you Void Sickness, players roll with a minus one bonus die and an auto-miss die on all skill checks. This effect lasts for an hour after leaving the void slash warp. The GM can also roll in the chart below to cause additional effects or make their own. Cut the warp time by three hours. Players gain an auto hit die on their next check. 1d3 players are afflicted by void sickness. Players gain an auto miss die on their next check. Roll an additional d6. If one or two are rolled, the ship ends up in the void. Or a void worm adversary chases after the players, or the ship is forced into the void. So, <sighs> and yet somehow this is still safer than warp travel in 40k. Only slightly safer. After all, there are no demons trying to murder, fuck, eat you to death. Mm-hmm. See, then we have multiple distance traveling. For each incremental jump slash warp distance, the difficulty of the check is increased by one level. Example, after warping to a, when warping to a planet two distances away, the difficulties would increase to pilot hard four, navigator average three, and engineer hard four. A warp once started cannot be canceled except by a problematic seven piloting check. If started this way, the starship would take half its max HP and damage to its hull. If stopped this way, mm -hmm. if they stopped the warp once started. Which certainly, may, certain, which given that it is, we have a case of technically correct in terms of the safe, the safeness of jump travel. I would say jump travel is is steady but safe, but also slower mm -hmm. because of the the cooldowns. As warp travel is faster, doesn't have cooldowns, but it's a fuel hog, and you and you um are rolling the are rolling the dice to make sure that nothing 
terrible happens. Uh -huh. um, I wonder if I wonder if Veil of the Void has its own version of Space Hulks in that regard. It's a good question. Let's see. Anyways, ship sizes. There are several classifications of ship sizes in space. Um, fighters slash shuttles, very small, either one by one or one by two squares, usually cost quarter of a million credits. Frigates or corvettes, um, they are medium sized, either one by three or two by two, cost one million credits. Destroyers slash cruisers, uh, medium two by three, cost ten million credits. I hope to God nobody tried nobody tried to buy a um, Baron in this setting. Yeah. One point two but one point two billion C bills. Too damn slow to do its job effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have carriers which is which is a large ship, either two by four or three by three. Costs 15 million credits. Battle T five yeah, five 50. zero yeah 50. Um, then we have battle cruisers, usually two by five or four by four, would cost 100 million credits. Then we have dreadnoughts, which are extra large, either three by six or seven by seven, would cost would cost 250 million credits, so quarter of a billion. So there's your pillar of autumn, everybody. Mm -hmm. Then fleet ships. Which would be giant, so either four by nine or nine by nine, usually cost four hundred million credits. I'd like to point out that earlier the size for fleet ships given in an example was gigantic plus. Mm -hmm. Um, need some clarification between that example in this non-space slash void combat and the ship sizes. Yeah, and then leviathans, which are gigantic, so five by fifteen or fifteen by fifteen. And on average, cost half a billion credits. That um, sounds like a space Hulk to me. I'd say fighters and shuttles. I'd say there's no shortage of examples on on what on from other media that we could use for that. Whether it be the Vipers in Battlestar Galactica or every ship you pilot in any Wing Commander game ever. <laughs> um, you know your X-wings, your t your Tie fighters, um, your your so the ver the ver the um various shuttle the various shuttles that seem to be three D printed in Voyager. <laughs> um, let's see, what would be a good what would be a good um. Good example of a frig of a frigate size ve frigate or corvette size vehicle in other media. Um, I'm think I'm thinking I'm, I'm thinking the Serenity. It can be, yeah. Uh, the Bebop as well, especially since well, the Bebop is a converted fishing ship. I mean, if we wanted to get uh really technical on some frigates um we could just look at more ds9 stuff mm -hmm. um then we have the then we have destroyers slash cruisers would the defiant count as a destroyer um in term in terms of size or do you, or do you think it's or, or do you think it's too small let me check. Um. The USS Defiant is... It's pretty big. I mean, it's you know, 170 meters by 134 meters by 30 meters. I'm not sure how that compares to squares and Veil of the Void, but I think I think she'd be considered a cruiser. I'm pretty sure she'd be considered a cruiser. 
she's too small to be a carrier. Yes. That's why that's why I'm saying she's probably a cruiser. Mm-hmm. Um Let's see. And as far as far as carriers, um I want to be a smart ass and say the helicarrier, but by but by spaceship comparison, the helicarrier in in um in the Avengers would be too small. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Then, then above that is battle cruisers. And if we're gonna go with um, with another Star Trek example, that would actually be uh, the USS Enterprise D. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as as far as dreadnoughts, what? Why am I thinking of Harlock's ship? Or the space battleship Yamato? <laughs> that too. Remember everybody, you don't get to fire your, your Hadoho more than twice because otherwise you will irradiate space. Even though that's not how radiation works. Thank you very fucking much, space battleship Yamato. Cut him some, cut him some slack. It, it's a product of its time. No, even the modern remake. It's the same reason they won't fire it more than twice. Not only because they're not sure about using a weapon that can cause genocide on that scale, but also because um, <laughs> they're afraid of increasing uh, the radiation of an area. <laughs> and I'm like, the, the amount of radiation that the Hadoho can, uh, can create is going to be like picto percentages of the cosmic it's you've you've all heard the the term a drop in the bucket or a drop in the ocean no this is one atom of h2o compared to all other water on earth and even then i don't think the scale is enough Mm -hmm. so yeah regardless let's keep going (laughs) yeah um let's see as far as fleet ships i'd say i'd say any um any 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 large ship you see you see in a you see in any form of Gundam would probably count under this especially the bigger ones um, um i wouldn't count some i wouldn't count something like white base in this white base would be too small to be a fleet ship uh, no most of the ships in Gundam would be too small to be fleet ships they're probably the size of battle cruisers or dreadnoughts mm-hmm. um the type of fleet ship that I'm thinking of, um, it's it's got to be the uh, <laughs> it's got to be the battle barges of of the space marines. Those things are gigantic. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then we and at the top we have leviathans and. While space hulks could count as could count as leviathan size, the tricky part about doing that is there is no standard with space hulks. I think if we had to standardize, it would be the largest class of Imperial Star Destroyer. Wouldn't that Which be? A... I... I think it's the Imp- Imperator class, and I think they're yeah. like five kilometers long. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's a Leviathan ship right there. Yeah, and I'm pr- I'm pretty sure you're not going to be seeing Leviathan ships all that often. And if you if you do, start start going the other way. <laughs> it's an endgame boss, monk. Mm-hmm. Huh. You see the Leviathan ship in the distance. I'm gonna go for it. Are you sure you're level two? Yep. I'm gonna go for it. You died, but I didn't get to roll. You died. Oh. Because these sizes are standard base measurements, but you can have bases bigger than the size listed above. <laughs> bigger is better. <laughs> Wait, All right. This... So you, so we, so um, so we could, so it could go. 
It could go to the level of, say, the world engine. Yes. There's a ter there's a terrifying thought. Or Getter Emperor. Mm -hmm. There's an even more terrifying thought. <laughs> I thought you might say that. <laughs> Everybody should watch Getter Robo Arc just to see the fact that Getter Emperor is three Leviathan-sized spacecraft that also can combine into a full Getter uh, that can hold Earth in the palm of its hand, basically. I love Getter, but sometimes Ken Ishikawa just did not know when to quit making the Getter 2 Getter. There's no such thing as 2 Getter, just so you know. Mm -hmm. oh. Then we have, we have a new we have a set of expertise specifically for vehicles. Yep, the one expertise they get upon build or purchase. Mm -hmm. So let's see. At v and this it will be chosen by the GM, or the GM might create one. So we have efficiency boosters, um, three more squares of movement, efficient fuel consumption. Ships use up half fuel consumption when traveling by warp or jump. I can see that being useful. <laughs> Especially if you have a warp engine. Mm -hmm. Fly the colors. The colors of your group or organization are proudly and vibrantly painted on your vehicle. This grants you an auto hit die to either speechcraft or intimidation rolls made above the made aboard the vehicle. Um, this is your hoist the black flag expertise. <laughs> this this is your let's go be Hosho Marine uh, expertise. No, monk, monk, monk. It's the paint your anime waifu on your ship expertise. I am not Seth Zinch. Monk. You know it's not just Seth Zinch that does it. You know that th this is something that happens in real fucking life and oh. has been happening for over 30 years in I'm real in... life. Oh, I know. Even before <laughs> anime waifus were a thing, there were bombshell waifus on planes. Bombshell girls, yep. yep. Bombshell. I think bombshell babes was the official term. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we called a lot of very attractive women bombshells. Yep. Then we have just a scratch. A scratch? Your arm's off! No, it's not. And what's that there? <laughs> Let's see. The vehicle has been repaired so many times that it's almost a roadmap of repair. When healed, repair an additional 5 HP. Oh, it's the Millennium one. Falcon. <laughs> Say again? It's the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> oh. Let's see, then we have... I was going to go with the Millennium Falcon, or it could possibly be any mech from Snord's Irregulars. <laughs> okay. Look, it is, until someone tells me otherwise, Snord's Irregulars is the Battletech version of Florida Man. Oh, I know. I know. Uh, let's see. Then, then we have Mimicry Shields. If a mimic is aboard a ship that has this expertise, they may use their physical misdirection skill utilizing the ship's shields. This place this places the shields on a one round cooldown. For a, for a ro <laughs> for a reminder for anyone who doesn't remember from the mimic uh physical misdirection. If an adversary hits you with a non-magical attack, you may spend your reaction to copy that attack back at them. The reflected attack inflicts the same damage that you sustained before deductions and up to four times judgment and max damage. I mean, yeah, it puts these shields on, it puts these shields on a one round cooldown, so you can't rely on it. But it just shows even more that mimics mimics seem to be the, seem to be um. I know I call, I know I made ninja references to mimics, but they seem to be more of the troll of the Veil of the Void universe. Yeah 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 ha 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 ha. Oh, let's see. Then we have noise dampeners. Special dampeners have been attached to this vehicle when performing a covert check. Gain plus one auto hit die. 
pretty sta pretty um, standard for stealth mode. Then we have overcharge scanners. This ship is incapable of getting lost while traveling through the stars, and its analysis checks roll with a plus one auto hit die. Nice. Stellar cartography, is that you? <laughs> um, and runic inscriptions. These simple inscriptions give the ship additional pr protection against magical effects hailing from one of the core realms. Shadow, reflection, arcane, presence, order, or chaos. When rolling to resist an effect, add an auto-hit die. Uh, These are 40k runic wards. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Yep. Then shadow-infused drive. The ship gains an additional charge for its stealth drive. I'm pretty sure we'll be covering stealth drives later. And spell inscription. One weapon on this vehicle can store and cast one spell per long rest. It can store a non-superlative spell of the highest level spellcaster of the group. Imagine so, if that spellcaster also has a point in weapon master. Magus, magus level spells from a gun? Go for it. <laughs> See, then we have mech expertises. First is Enhanced Jets, so plus five squares of movement. So, good old Jump Jets. Extra Blade, a small pocket is hidden alongside the arms of this mech, allowing a single-handed blade to be attached. Yo, we heard you like chopping, so we put choppers on your arms so you can chop while you chop. Mm -hmm. And Powered Armor. An enhanced armor on this mech gives additional damage resistance. Reduce all incoming damage by 10% after shield mitigation. Let's see, then... Runic Enhancement. This unique expertise allows an Arcanting unit to cast spells through the mech itself, using the outer runes to their benefit. <laughs> a mech a mech pilot who can still cast there is a terrifying thought i mean we see it in quite a few different uh anime so i mean like yep and let me make this worse a mimic who's a mech pilot let me make this even worse monk magic knights rares fair <laughs> <laughs> So then we have Cargo Loader. This mech is specifically designed for the loading and unloading of starships and other vehicles. While operating, this mech gain plus one bonus level in muscle, and you carry three times the normal amount. Would you say their muscle is rippling? No. <laughs> Enhanced shields. Mechs with this expertise gain plus five shields. Stabilizers, a mech with this expertise grants its user plus one bonus level in balance while in operation. And zero-g control, this expertise gives a mech greater control over movement in zero-g. It gains an auto-hit die on all balance and flight checks while moving through zero-g. So I'd say just about every, just about every Gundam in the last 50 years. You want to know what the scariest thing of all is, Monk? What? A ball with the double Zeta's high mega cannon. <laughs> then, I, and now I want now I want a death battle match between a ball and an urban mech. Uh, where are they fighting? On the on um, terra firma. You see, that's that's the problem, Monk. Balls don't operate on terra firma. Shit. They're space only. Despite what Gundam Battle Assault 2 will try to convince you of otherwise. Um, well, if we can't... if And obviously, urban mechs can't fight in space. I mean, I don't think any of the... I... I don't think anything from Battletech can fight in space effectively... Like, they can fight in space, effectively. And, well, after the advent of the Ares Conventions, um, 
space combat started to dial itself back. Die. Yeah. Of course, by the succession wars, and and it was pretty much dead because everybody had ran through all of their damn warships. Yep. Let's see. Then we get to purchasable mechs. All default mechs, their abilities and their prices are below. All mechs require a two-hour recharge every week. So we have skeleton mech, which is suit class and costs 10000 A fitted power suit. So suit once again, suit class costs 40000 A standard mech, which is mech class and costs 200000 And a Titan LR4, which is Titan class, obviously, and costs $15 million. First we have skeleton mech. This... This mech suit is a minor mech that lines the entire body of an individual. It is composed of ironite, a durable yet light material. It grants the user mi minor bonuses. Plus one bonus level in balance and plus 10% HP while worn. It is affordable and can be improved over time. This is your custom build. Mm -hmm. You get this and then over time you build on top of it. Mm -hmm. Then we have power suits. Unlike the skeleton mech, this suit fully surrounds the user and grants an improved atmosphere. This atmosphere grants pure breathable air for two hours. While worn, it gives heavy armor four with no negative movement effects. It also comes equipped with a heavy thruster and gives plus 20% max HP while worn. Let's see. It's, I'd say a, I'd say a power I'd say a power suit is what is what a lot of people are going to think of when they think of power armor. Yeah. For sure. Uh, whereas the the skeleton one, what honestly what com honestly what comes to mind is an exosuit, like the ones you'd see in um, All You Need Is Kill. Yeah. Let's see, then we have standard mechs. The standard mech is considered a mech. It is usually two times taller than the pilot, large size, and follows the stats below: power five, finesse six, vitality four. Medium armor, 100 HP, shields 5, movement 6, no intergalactic drive, 2-hour to to recharge, which we already mentioned, and has a force blade, which does 3d6 plus 5 force damage. Nice. And then we have the Titan. This is a rare class, this is a rare class mech of massive size, 9x9, crafted by the Elon Smiths. Its stats are below. Power 10, Finesse 6, Vitality 8, Tough Armor, 1500 HP, 20 shields, so it can reduce, so I think that would mean it can reduce 20 damage 8 times. Before requiring a recharge, yes. Mm -hmm. Movement of 8, and attacks 2 Dual Plasma Repeaters, range 1825, deals 3d6 plus 5 plasma, a Railgun, um, 20, 50, 20, um, 50, 86 plus 5 energy, a force blade, 3d6 plus 5 force, and dual plasma ba blades, 5d6 plus 5 plasma. See, then we have, per so, if it's not, if it's considered 9x9 nine nine massive size. Probably uh, the size of a Warhound or a Warlord Titan. Mm-hmm. I don't think they'd make anything as big as an Imperator class. That just means we have to make it, Monk. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm making that, I'd have to be paid in alcohol. Uh, I'll do it for the funsies. Let's see. Purchasable vehicles. There are a few common vehicles to make getting around faster and easier. We have Explorer class, which costs one hundred and twenty-five thousand. Um, land ve land velocitor, land velocitor. Yep, which costs ten thousand, and warp fighter, which costs sixty-five thousand. Why do I feel like land velocitor is just a fancy name for speeder bike? Probably, because everybody <laughs> loves the fucking speeder bikes. Uh, so first we have Explorer class shuttle. This stylish Explorer-class explore shuttle is produced by Veraco. It can fit six people comfortably. The caliber repeaters attack in a 
in a in a 360 degree arch. Its stats are ex are listed below. I would like to I would like to make two corrections here. First of all, the typo monk just pointed out with a laugh. In a in a, you only need one in a. And second, I would really like to point out that 360 degrees is no longer called an arc. It's called a circle. Mm -hmm. Oh. So power four, finesse six, vitality four, medium armor, 400 HP, 10 shields, movement seven, has a jump drive, and 500 tons of fuel, has um, what has a caliber repeater, so plus three, plus three attack, um, range 12, 24, does 3d6 plus 10 piercing, uh, and it can hold an additional 100 tens of fuel. Void jumps take one less round to charge, minimum two. I'd like to point out that this is 500 to tons of ordic fuel. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's going to be necessary or not, or maybe that just means it's ordinary. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Then we then we have the Land Velocitor, which is a speeder-like vehicle crafted by the Human Corporation of Solar Yards. It can comfortably fit two people, one driver, one passenger. Its max speed is 125 and uses ordic and plasmic fuel. It can hold 30 gallons. When written in combat, it travels at 40 squares during your movement phase. It may travel at 20 miles a gallon. When not in use, it shrinks down to a medium-sized cube. 20 miles a gallon is terrible gas mileage for something that's basically a motorcycle. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's basically a Harley Davidson. Got it. <laughs> a Harley Gate, a Harley Davidson <clears throat> by way of Capsule Corporation. Yep. Let's see, and then we have Warp Fighter. This is an experimental one-man fighter created by the Prototype Corporation, Nanocorp. The plasma ray has a in, in a <laughs> has a in a um, 360-degree arch attack. It's a, it's always going to bug me when they mention a 360-degree arc. Mm -hmm. So, power three, finesse eight, vitality three. Has light armor, 100 HP, 5 shields, um, 10 movement, has a warp drive, two, has 2 tons of ordic fuel, and a plasma ray, which is a plus 2 attack with a range of 8, to fi 8 and 15, does 2d6 plus 5 plasma damage, and experimental drive. This experimental fighter has a built-in warp drive. This drive can be activated once per day to warp to a neighboring planet. It's an X-Wing. Yep. Let's see, then we get to fuel uses. All starships have access to fuel and use it to power their ship's travel. Fuel is primarily used when a ship attempts to warp and jump. The most common fuel type is Ordic, found in nearly every refueling station. Fuel is not consumed while encircling a planet unless you stay circling for up to three days, after which 10 tons will be used. As an action, engineers on a starship may expend 20 tons of fuel to allow the pilot to instantly rotate a large ship or to double the movement speed of a ship. If a ship has expended all of its fuel, it cannot leave its current location until refueled. Nice. See, and then we have it looks like a chart of all the oh yeah vehicle and starship items what am I saying these additional vehicle and starship items can be purchased from most vehicle vendors they usually require an hour of repair time and take one average three crafting check and one hard four mechanics check so we have arcane dampeners any arcane attack made against this vehicle will have has its effects halved, and the Arcanting unit rolls with minus one bonus die on the check. Cost 20,000. An EMP core. This device sends out a targeted EMP blast once every 10 rounds. This blast disrupts a specific vehicle within 15 squares of your vehicle, disabling it until the end of their next turn. Costs 115k. 
Oh, and we have hardened shields. These vehicle shields prevent damage from caliber bullets, but take two rounds longer to recharge any touch five mechanics check to repair. I think that's supposed to be tough. I think uh, so too. I'm pretty sure it's another. Costs 25,000. Then improved jump core. With this item, a ship reduces their jump charge rounds by half, and they use 10% less fuel. Cost half a cost half a million. Then side thrusters. A vehicle with this may rotate as if as if its finesse is equal to eight plus. Costs a quarter million. Well then, I, I was kidding when it came to that joke, but here you go, one way one easy way to do it. I'm gonna make a Leviathan ship that has side thrusters. Mm -hmm. If you're already paying half a billion credits, what's another measly quarter million? Yep. Then we have whole. Then we have our first proper category of hole plating. All no, ho hold on. Good. Warp. Warp compass. Oh, oh, forgot about that. Warp compass Al allows a ship to instantly cancel a warp without damaging the ship. This may activate once every long rest. Costs a quarter million. Basically, you don't have to make this the the seven check, and you don't take half your hole damage. Or take half your whole maximum in damage, I should say. Mm -hmm. Now we get the whole plating. Yeah. Now a universal rule with whole plating: all whole plating may be activated as an action by the engineer and lasts five rounds with a five-round cooldown. So first we have ablative armor, deployable heavy armor plates that raise a vehicle's armor level by one. All shields and weapons are disabled, but engines gain a three-square speed boost due to low power requirements. Costs 60,000. Then Ether Gloss Resin, a protoplasmic resin coating synthesized from deteriorated exiled cells, negates energy impacts by absorbing it into the ether, grants resistance to energy weapons, costs 25,000. So you're co you're... You're covering your ship's hull in revived dead people's ectoplasm, essentially. Mm -hmm. Let's see That's that. fucking busted. <laughs> and nano steel prototype designed plating causes small impacts on the hull to bounce, granting resistance to caliber weapons. Cost twenty five thousand. Then polarized plating, a weave of a natric ore and corpic ruby quartz filaments that can be charged with energy to create a defensive aura that defends against larger projectiles and slows moving debris. Explosive weapons roll with minus one bonus die and cannot critically hit while active. Costs 40,000. Nice. Let's see, then we have shield arrays which are counted as augmentations. First is the Ordic Overcharger. You may sacrifice movement speed to divert power to shields and bring the energy point density up, making the shield impenetrable to non-Ordic weaponry for one round. This will overload the shields, causing them to expire. They cannot be repaired for a full round. Costs 50,000. So this is your all power to sh all, all power to shields thing. Again, I wonder if he's played a lot of STO. Mm -hmm. oh. Then Plasma Deflectors. This array may be activated by an engineer as an action, and 250... L? Is that supposed to be liters? That's odd when we've been using tons so far. Tons. Yeah. Um, might want to consider changing that. Mm -hmm. Unless... You do mean 250 liters, which is... Uh, well, if we take a look real quick at metric, I'm pretty sure that's a quarter of a ton. Mm -hmm. of, fu of fuel to overcharge the shield generator to absorb the next energy, plasma, or arcane attack. Costs yeah. 3,000. One metric ton is a thousand liters, so it's a quarter of a ton. 
Mm-hmm. If he means a quarter of a ton, then that's technically correct. Yeah. Um, then Sonic Deflectors. As an action, a crew member can activate and focus the shields in a direction on a, a enemy will be attacking from. So long as the shield is active, 2d6 damage will be redirected back towards the attackers. Costs 30,000. Nice. So next is melee weapons. Uh, first is force blade. This blade is formed of hardened light and inflicts 3d6 plus 5 force damage to the target. After successfully hitting a non-large target, they may be pushed back up to 5 squares. Cost 25,000. Um, imagine giving one of the bigger ships that upgrade. Or giving it a melee weapon, period. Are we the outlaw star now or something? <laughs> Just saying. Uh, well, if you're getting, if ramming is going to be an option for ships, you may as well make it more effective. Indeed. Uh, and we have a hard light ram. Mm -hmm. um, plasma blade. A plasma blade inflicts 5d6 plus 5 plasma damage and inflicts armor break on the target. <sighs> armor break inflicted on a vehicle instead grants a weakness to physical damage. Costs 40,000. Nice. Uh, let's see, then we have ranged weapons. First is a dual plasma repeater. Takes up two weapon slots but gives 1d3 attacks once per round. Its range is 2030 in a 180 degree front facing arch, and each attack inflicts 3d6 plus 5 plasma damage. Costs 30,000. So, DACA squared. Indeed. Then, Railgun. This weapon has a range of 3050 and a 180 degree front facing arch and inflicts 8d6 plus 5 energy damage to a hit target. Costs 25,000. Nice. See, and then Warp Cannon. This blaster inflicts 3d6 plus 5 chaos damage with a range of 20 in a 360 degree arch. When this weapon successfully hits, it warps the armor of the target, granting your future attacks an auto hit die. This effect lasts until the cannon is used on another target, uses warp ammo, costs 50,000. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, let's see, then we have Drive. First is the Jump Drive. Jump Drives provide a relatively safe method of intergalactic travel. The main downsides are that it is slow to warm up and cool down, costs 400,000. Then Protection Drive. Grants protection from all realm effects within the Arcane, Reflection, and Shadow Realms. Does not use up a travel slot. Costs 275,000. This is what you use if you need to go to one of those three realms. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then Stealth. Grants the ship Covert plus 3 with an auto hit die on Covert checks. Has three uses after which it goes into... Four, into what's the 4 here? That's another typo. Yep. It's pro no, it's probably supposed to be goes into cooldown for a long rest. Yep. Does not use up a travel slot. Costs 85000 That's a cheap stealth drive. And warp engine, which we've already explained what warp engines are, which costs 800000 Double the price for double the danger. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then we have the three types of fuel. First is Naturic which costs 15,000 per 1,000 tons. Um, Ordic costs 6,000 per 1,000 tons. And Standard, which costs 2,000 per 1,000 tons. Where's Plasma? Plasma's fuel was mentioned with the land, land Velocitor. Plasmic fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have weapon cells. So Caliber refills Caliber weapons. Actually, all of these are just refill of the same type. So, Caliber costs 5,000. Energy, also 5,000. Plasma, 10,000. And Warp, 10,000. And then we get to my favorite section, Legendary Stuff. Yep. Even starships have had some strange and unique items built for them. These are some fantastic creations that dot this universe. First is the Annihilation Ray, which is extraordinary. 
This weapon is an abomination crafted by the mad Corian forge lord of old. This weapon can be placed on a large or higher sp sized ship. The annihilation ray may be fired once per 48 hour period. This weapon automatically inflicts 185 pure damage to the target and 75 damage to the equipped ship. It's a dual edged sword. It hurts you and them. Mm -hmm. Nice. See, then we have the Corian Rune Drive. A Rune Drive is part Forge, part Furnace, and part Mayan Temple. It takes <laughs> condensed power to f it takes condensed power from a ship's core, accelerates it, and weaves it in a gravitational field to create a small star. The inverse gravimetric wave generated by this star and the field is funneled into the superstructure, allowing the ship to be moved as one would direct a spell or move a cursor. The excess heat is vented through several exhaust ports for planetary thrust or for offensive purposes in space, inflicting 8d6 plus power in damage to all targets within five squares of the ship. And Ex Hold on. I'm trying to I'm trying to first parse through the techno bullshit. Inverse gravimetric wave. Somebody's been watching way too much Star Trek. Um, <clears throat> so gravity funneled into the superstructure of the ship in such a way that the ship can be moved without thrust, essentially. It's the fucking Planet Express ship! <laughs> It doesn't move. It, the universe moves around it. Fucking Christ. You know, given some of the references we've we've put up with at this point, is that really a surprise? No. Let's see. Then we have legendary ship examples. Blow is the most famous ship to have traversed the styles of the reactant galaxies. The stars the, of the of reacting yeah, galaxy. Star. Uh the Pondering Infinity, which is a frigate class. This is a specialized Arcana Tech vehicle that was designed by the Elon and Corians. The ship was flown originally by the infamous Corian general engineer Wardan Invantor. After the Battle the of Pri Go ahead. I was gonna say Verdan Invantor. But, mm -hmm. After the Battle of Pride, the Pondering Infinity was lost somewhere within the realm of Adareth. It was eventually recovered by a wandering party of adventurers. Tendo, pilot. Azrel, doctor. Kegwen, officer. OB3, arcane specialist. Starflower, mechro dri driver. Duke, weapon specialist. Tuchanka, Tuchanka. Desnorath, bounty hunter. And captained by Thaddeus Darkrider. <laughs> I have a feeling that this was an actual campaign. <laughs> but there's no way that it, that any of those there's there, there's absolutely no way that what, that those names are not character names. I especially like how everybody's role is in um is in parentheses except for Tuchanka. Well, Tuchanka is Tuchanka. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the who, who whoever was playing the whoever was playing Tuchanka has played enough Mass Effect to know that Krogan or Krogan monk. Mm -hmm. Uh, then we have then we have the stats of it. Power five, finesse seven. <laughs> Monk, I have power seven on the newest revision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think I said power seven. Power I think seven. You said power five. Yep. My bad. Power seven, finesse seven, vitality five, medium armor, four hundred HP, fifteen shields, movement eight, as a warp drive. 800,000 tons of natric fuel has... 800,000 tons? Yep. What the shit? Remember that it only takes like 500 tons to move to what is essentially Galactic Center, Monk. Mm -hmm. That's fucking busted. Well, this is a legendary ship. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. So two two attacks. Mm -hmm. Two um, energy repeater nine eighteen two d six plus ten energy. 
and Plasma Launcher, 2040 for range, 5d6 plus 5 Plasma, and Warp Charge. As an action, the pilot co-pilot may activate this ability and overcharge the shields. The ship then charges in a 3 times speed straight line warping through anything in its path. This attack inflicts 10d6 plus 25 pure damage, pierces shields, and requires a successful average 3 piloting and mechanics check. On a success, your ship loses its shields. Otherwise, the Pondering Infinity takes half damage. This ability may only be activated once every short rest. It's a vanguard in ship form. <laughs> Just imagine that from the enemy side of the of the coin. Monk, it's a vanguard in ship form. The biotic charge ability? Yeah. Okay. So the... I guess the last thing we have is the general stats for custom vehicles. Mm -hmm. So these are these stats are base stats used to help create a custom vehicle slash starship. These are base stats and can be and can be adjusted as des as desired. All vehicles get a minimum of one expertise at creation. Uh, so fighters and simple mechs base 100 HP, 2d6 damage, 10 shields, six to nine movement, one ability. Frigates. Think... Oh, go ahead. I think abilities are those things like the warp charge and stuff. Mm -hmm. Which I'd like to see a few examples of what would constitute abilities so we don't get too ridiculous. I know we've crossed that threshold with the Pondering Infinity, but still. I mean, it's not that ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So then we have frigates, base 400 HP, 1 to 2 attacks with 2d6 damage, 15 shields. 5 to 7 movement, 1 to 2 abilities. Then destroyers, ca destroyers, carriers, and battlecruisers. Base 2500 HP, 2 to 4 attacks with three, with 2 or 3d6 damage, 20 shields, uh, 5 to 6 movement, and 2 to 3 abilities. Then um, dreadnought, base 6000 HP. 3 to 5 attacks with 3 or 46 damage, 25 shields, 5 movement, and 2 to, two to 4 abilities. Then fleet ships, base 12,000 HP, 4 to 6 attacks with 4 to 5d6 damage, 30 shields, 4 movement, and 2 to 4 abilities. And then leviathans, base 25,000 HP, 7 a pl 7 plus attacks with 5 or 66 damage, 50 shields, 2 to 3 movement, and 4 to 6 abilities. I thought of one more uh, Leviathan that we didn't even name. What? Mothership from Homeworld. Yeah. That thing's fucking ginormous and runs its own economy as part of an RTS, Monk. It's a fucking Leviathan. Yeah, it it is. Um, and I love that game. I absolutely love Homeworld. Mm -hmm. um, if you if if you had to play buy or sell between Homeworld one and two, which which would you lean on? Oh fuck you, Monk! That one's actually really hard. But I would probably have to lean by for Homeworld 2. Oh. If only because of all of the mechanical improvements, if nothing else. Mechanical improvements, yes. When it comes to narrative, if I'm being honest, I kind of prefer the first one. Yeah. But I, I play I play Homeworld because I like making a swarm of ships that tear apart the rest of the galaxy. Of course, if I wanted to be the smartass, I could cheat and say Cataclysm. Eat dicks. <laughs> but i i like I like what I'm I like what I'm seeing out of out of some parts. Um, I do think that because 
when it comes to, when it comes to the gen when it comes to the general st the general stats, I didn't see anything that would that would dictate what the general uh, what the baseline for the virtues would be. Yeah, um, I I think it, I think the the vehicles section is very well done, but it needs a little more fleshing out. Mm -hmm. And while I do, I do realize that this is a completed project that is released, um, if we had just a little like a a good baseline to know how the virtues, you know, it, whether it's just you have in general you should have this many virtue points sp split amongst these three. For example, like the, the the Titan mech has uh, twenty six total virtue points, or twenty four total virtue points. Excuse me. Um, so it, you, you know, maybe you say on a Titan size mech, you you should have on average twenty four points split amongst the three virtues, mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, that would be a good guide post. Um, I don't know if maybe that's somewhere in the GM guide area or if that's something elsewhere or maybe it's not in here. Um, also, as I was briefly scrolling through uh, the GM guide just as a way to perhaps check uh, if it uh, if it's in there... Um, I scrolled past a box that said being overpowered is okay, or it's okay to be broken. And I don't know if we'll get to that as part of our exploration of the GM guide, or if we'll even explore the GM guide. Uh, we we will explore the we will explore the GM guide. Um, okay. But yeah, I think when it comes, I think when some, it comes to go ahead, uh, go ahead, <laughs> you first. I think so, I think um, well, let me let me see how let me see what the page count for the GM guide is. Uh, there isn't there's enough there there's enough there to cover. There might be some things that we skim though. We'll see. Yeah, there's probably some skimming that needs to be done. Um, although it might be fun to go through the questionnaire to uh to for backstory inspiration in a little more detail. Mm-hmm. I know that we briefly covered it when we looked at it during the reading of the initial rules that mentioned it. Yeah. But but <laughs> next week obviously is going to be GM guide and then after that will be it will be what I'm calling the grab bag. Cuz while we've been doing this there's been there've been a few things that have dropped that I think are I think um we couldn't fit we couldn't fit into into any one into any one spot he, um in the chapters that we were going through. Mm -hmm. So we're covering them in the back as a um as a cover my ass kind of th kind of thing. Yeah. But and and then we also are not going through the uh the Philly Deus's guide. I'm not going through that because the, because that's a whole that's that's a whole lot of um of of setting specific material and I I generally try and avoid covering covering the nitty gritty of of settings either through reviews or through this kind of thing. Yeah, Philly Deus book of monsters, myths, and magic is essentially uh, part. Part lore, part divine, part a bunch of other things, and at the very end, the Book of Monsters is essentially a partial bestiary. But I, I think covering the GM's guide and then the grab bag is going to be the good, the good last steps for this. Yeah, and the grab bag we're only we're only covering three things. Um. The Etimret species, the Blade Dancer class, and the Nightfall expansion. Which, covering the Nightfall expansion is a little bit out of season, but it is what it is. You'll see when we get to it. 
It is what it is. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>